Shabbat of the new year. And uh, we're going to return back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. So, Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord, for bringing us through 2020. Thank God that's past us. But, Lord, we just see 2021 looming, Lord, over us. It to be worse. <laughs> So, Lord, we pray for grace and strength, and Lord, we just thank you for your word, your word that encourages us, your word that changes us and makes us more like you. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit in us, that you live through us and for us, and we just give you thanks and all praise and glory and honor. Yeshem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the subject of Paul's epistle here on uh, this portion is on giving. So you all know that I avoid, <laughs> I avoid this subject, you know, all the time, but uh, I'm not going to skip over the text. So when I thought about uh, why it is that I, I don't like to teach on giving, uh, it came to me this way. I likened it to uh, a former Catholic um, and why uh, Protestant churches avoid the topic of Mary, okay? The Protestants see her as the mother of Yeshua, but the Roman Catholic Church elevates her to a status of deity or goddess. And so to steer clear of such blasphemy like this, the Protestant or evangelical church put her on the back shelf in the back room, and that's what I do with the subject of giving. So I witnessed so many abuses um, designed to motivate giving, false promises of blessings and anointing, what God is going to give you, that he'll give you a thousandfold increase. And all this is done by a preacher who is motivated not by the good of the people, but by greed. So this produces non-biblical givers. They give for the wrong motivation. They give with the wrong expectation. And Paul is teaching us the way that Yahweh would have us to give and why. So Paul exhorts us to understand that we are imitators of Messiah. It is our Lord Yeshua who selflessly gives everything for the good of his people, for the good of others. So this is our motivation, and this is our model. We're not supposed to be motivated um, by anything but love. And uh, it's not about the promise of wealth. It's the promise of doing good for others. I remember I was invited to a conference in, uh, in Canada back in 2007, and this was Todd Bentley. Now, uh, at the time, I knew nothing about him. I was invited to go, and now we know that he is a false teacher and a false prophet. But at the time, I'd never heard of him before. And uh, we were up there for four days. And each day, twice a day, they would spend 45 minutes to an hour teaching on giving or giving testimonies about giving and increase. And uh, this was all done before they would take an offering twice a day. And he had come up with this bright idea that the more you give, the more God will bless you. And so he had taught his own team that, uh, you know, you have to try to give more than everybody else. So they would go out to dinner and they'd practically, they'd practically end up in a brawl over who was going to pick up the check. So they, they all wanted the blessing, but they were not interested in blessing others. They just wanted to be blessed. So this comes from the devil. It's selfish. It's not selfless. So then it's important that we understand uh, what the Bible says is why we give and how we are to give. So we're in chapter 8, uh, starting at verse 1. 
Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. You want to remember that. They first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So part of the Christian spiritual life is giving. Paul writes that the Macedonian church uh, was giving joyfully and abundantly, but they gave out of poverty. They gave sacrificially. It reminded me of um, years ago, uh, Rabbi Lieber would go to the Ukraine and uh, he would go visit the Messianic community over there. Now, this was in the 90s and uh, they were so impoverished, uh, very, very poor. There was no money from the government for uh, infrastructure. The roads and the sidewalks were treacherous. Uh, you really couldn't even walk anywhere because the roads, I mean, he talked about uh, not just a crack in the concrete, but like deep ditches between one side of the sidewalk and the other. And uh, you certainly didn't walk after hours when it was dark, you couldn't see. They had certain hours that they would turn the electricity on and certain hours that they would turn the water on. And the rest of the time you didn't have either. So he would go and visit the elderly and some of them were Holocaust survivors. And uh, he talked about how he would walk into this very humble house and they would set one meal in front of him. And, uh, you know, this was the very best they had. They, he would give them some bread and some meat and, you know, whatever else they had that they could put together. And uh, this was what they had for the week. This was their very meager provision, but they gave it to the man of God uh, joyfully. And you can imagine what the rabbi would say. Oh, no, no, this is all you have. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm good. But they would urge him, no, no, please take it. This was their offering. This was their gift to him. And so Paul writes that they gave themselves first to the Lord. The sacrifice had already been made in their hearts before the Lord, just like like Abraham had sacrificed his son in his heart long before he ever got to the point of lifting up that knife. So we set aside, you know, whatever um, we can. And just like the people in Ukraine, they, they put aside whatever they could from their meager existence. And uh, then it was carried out in the actual giving. But first they gave it in their hearts to the Lord. This is what is giving out of poverty or giving sacrificially. Uh, verse 6. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So the uh, Corinthian church, remember, was uh, abounding in spiritual gifts. It was much teaching there, good and bad. But they were a wealthy church. They were a worldly church caught up in the latest fashions and in status and all these things, you know, the last in 1 Corinthians and in parts of 2nd, we've already heard Paul address those things, you know, kind of chastising them. But Paul is telling them, with all the things that you've been blessed with, both temporally and spiritually, abound in the grace of giving 
to the needs of others as well. Remembering that the king who set aside all of the glories of heaven and all of the honor that was due him as our creator to live in the poverty of humanity and to be rejected, abused for our sakes so that we could become rich. So recall the, the letter to the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3. These people had material comforts. They had all they could have. They were, they were boasting about how we are rich, we have need of nothing. But they were spiritually poor. So they believed the blessing, the, the temporal blessing, to be the evidence that they had the favor of God. But Yeshua said in Revelation 3, 17, Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and know not that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. They were trusting in what we would know as the prosperity gospel. The belief that wealth is the favor of God, and it's his will for you to be rich with temporal wealth. When you hear them preach this kind of malarkey, it's always motivated by greed. God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to be rich. You know, sow your thousand dollar seed and he'll multiply it back to you. Well, where is the motivation in love? There is no love in that. It's all about selfishness. It's not about helping anybody else. The only one they're helping get rich is that lying pastor. This is not the evidence that you are God's. The problem with the prosperity gospel is that uh, these false preachers keep fleecing the sheep. The, the giving is done under compulsion or, or coercion. The, the people are told that if they give a particular amount, and it's usually something extraordinary, that they will receive a blessing or they'll get an anointing or some other empty promise. So the people give, and some much more than they can afford. But they're giving because they have an expectation of a financial return for their investment. Paul was talking about sacrificial giving to help another saint or group of saints, expecting nothing in return, only trusting in the Father to meet our needs. The difference is one is done in love and the other one is done in greed. And then conversely, the, the church in Smyrna, this is the persecuted church. They are commended by the Lord in Revelation 2.9. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. So like Peter and John at the gate, beautiful. They said, silver and gold have we none, but what we have, we freely give. And so the faith community at Smyrna was poor in this world's goods, but they were rich in faith. They were persecuted and the Lord was pleased because of their faith. So the saying goes, there are both poor rich men and rich poor men in God's sight. Verse 10, and in this I give advice, it is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and you're desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. So it would appear that there had been a discussion about a collection taken up the previous year but they didn't follow through with it. So again, using the Ukraine uh, experience as an example, they would know that he was going to go some months down the road and uh, they would take up collection of goods and money well in advance of the trip. They would try to fill a shipping container to make the trip over worthwhile. And so um, if all they did was talk about it, if all there was was committees and talking, but nothing came of it more than discussion, then the people would not benefit that needed it most. 
So talking about it and actually giving are two different things. Verse 12, for if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what one does not have. So this brings me uh, to the more recent shift in offering, accepting credit cards. Should we be charging our offering to our credit card? Yes. Because giving from a credit card is money that you do not have. It's not your money. I was in a church that wanted to raise some money for a new building and uh, they brought in a motivational speaker who has since been proved to be a charlatan. And uh, he spent the entire evening manipulating the audience, and I mean audience because it was a show. And in the end, everyone was urged to make a thousand dollar contribution or a pledge. Even if you didn't have it, just sign this IOU and you won't miss out on the special anointing that's gonna come upon this church. But if you don't give, then you won't be a partaker of that anointing. I think they call that simony, selling the Holy Spirit, selling the blessing of God. I can just think of uh, you know, the scene where Groucho Marx is trying to sell swampland in Florida. It amounts to the same thing. So they are simply lying to the people. They're bribing them to do what the scripture says ought not to be done, giving what you do not have. Verse 13, for I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality as it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. So he was not asking them to give more than they could. It would make no sense to help someone to pay their rent, and then you cannot pay yours. But when one is in abundance, then that person can help the one who's in lack. And then one day, the person who was in abundance may have lack, and then the others may be able to help them. This is God's divine economy. This is how Adonai planned to take care of his people, one for another. The love of the community was supposed to care for its own, keeping them separate from the world so that they would not need to lean on the government. The Jewish community today still does this, although the Christian community does not do this overall. But they have the Jewish Federation that helps anyone, not just Jewish people, but particularly Jews. Uh, this is something that is all uh, over the world. They help people at home, locally. They will help people in Israel. So no matter what their situation is, if they have a medical need, if they have uh, need of transportation to doctor's appointments, if they need, you know, emergency money. Uh, all these things are there for them. And I recall that uh, when my son was ill, we needed a tutor. Um, they provided someone to come out uh, to help us. And so uh, he had a tutor from the Jewish Federation and it cost us nothing. So that was a real blessing. Jews from all over the world, they generously contribute to the Federation and it's to take care of their own people. This is what the Lord, this is what Adonai has called us to do, to care for one another. This is where, you know, the commandment of the Lord is, you know, love one another as I have loved you. Well, Messiah is the gracious giver. And so he gave of himself. And so he asks us to do the same. Of course, you know, we're not meant to do this alone. It is the Lord working among us and through us. He lives in us. And so this is like the primary way that we express him, that he comes through us because he, he loves to give. He loves to care for his people. And when we give him the opportunity to do that, 
we are really seeing Jesus. Paul uses the term equality. And today this is being all twisted and mangled. This is not the same as the socialist political ideology of the redistribution of wealth. This is a forced seizure of wealth that is redistributed to everyone so that everyone is equally poor. The biblical model has to be a willing mind. You have to be willing to give. God is not going to pry it out of your hand. If the person is not willing to give, then they should keep it. This is a good place to remind us of Ananias and Sapphira who they had wealth and they sold their property, but they held back a sum from the proceeds. But this was all for show. They wanted to be you know, appearing as selfless, that they were giving everything for the ministry, but they kept some of the profit from the sale. Now, there was no compulsion to make them, you know, have to hoard back some money. There was uh, nothing but their own greed and the, the appearance that they wanted to be sacrificial. This was hypocrisy. And so they lied to the Holy Spirit in their hypocrisy and they died. So if you want to give the money, then give it. If you don't want to, then keep it. God doesn't want it. So, you know, you don't have to lie and you don't have to pretend to be giving more than you are. Uh, this, this, God knows everything. He knows the motivation of our heart. He knows why we do it and he knows what we've done. Verse 16, but thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. We have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind, avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift, which is administered by us, providing honorable thing, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. So Paul was watching over his integrity. He was sharing in something of a, a, a committee of men who had a good reputation for the gospel. And this was for accountability. So there was no one that was going to be able to accuse him of misappropriating the funds for his own purposes. He was not like Judas, who was a thief stealing from the money bag. So he stirred them up to have a mindset of giving. And so by Titus going ahead of them, he did this on his own and, uh, he wanted to make sure that the people were prepared. He was caring for their spiritual state. So we are supposed to be imitators of Messiah, and he himself is the giver of all givers. So it's a spiritually healthy thing to be predisposed to give or to bless others. It gives us a godly character to hold our temporal possessions loosely all the while trusting our Father to meet our own needs. So the church in the book of Acts, they held all things in common. Whatever, you know, the attitude of whatever is mine is yours. And so they met each other's needs and no one lacked anything. We resist greed and we resist selfishness with this kind of a mindset. This is what family does. This is how people who love each other and care for one another live. This is the family of Yahweh. I have, to, uh, I have to just say that as small as our community is and has been, uh, I have seen this kind of love and care among us. I don't have, uh, I don't know what the Lord would say, but I personally do not have any, um, correction or anything in this community because at different times whether it was someone in need or giving to Israel or whatever we did it was done freely without coercion and people really 
uh, really responded the best that each one could. We had, <clears throat> we had the opportunity to care for a family for a while, uh, a couple of times. And, uh, you know, the Lord really, really um, moved, I think, among us. And I'm just real, real proud of you guys. Verse 22, and we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and our boasting on your behalf. Whenever we're dealing with money, you know, you have to go to extra lengths to protect your reputation. Because, you know, the first thing somebody wants to do is say, oh, they're just after the money. You know, people who rarely go to church claim that they don't go to church because all they want is to reach into their wallet. So he was defending the reputation of the men that he sent. He was showing that their lives were committed to the gospel and for the glory of Messiah. He was vouching for them. Integrity in the matter of money was especially important to Paul. He didn't want to do anything that would compromise the gospel. Speaking to the leaders of Ephesus in uh, Acts chapter 20, Paul says when he, de when he departs, ravenous wolves would come among them and they would seek to devour the flock. The false teachers would rise up even among themselves. And Paul reminds that the demonstration that he gave of his own life where he worked with his own hands to support himself it was so that he would not give the skeptics and the naysayers an opportunity to claim that he preached only for profit. So therefore he exhorts in Acts 20 verse 33, I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands served my necessities and those who were with me. I have shown you all things so that by laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So uh, there's a couple of ways you can interpret that scripture. And there's a common way that everybody seems to see, but I see something different. Uh, people will say, well, he's talking about, you know, that you should, as a minister, labor so that you can help those who are poor and, and uh, infirm. But I don't believe that's the correct interpretation because, um, you know, clearly the uh, apostles were, um, they gave up doing other labor. Even Yeshua pulled them away from their jobs. And even in the book of Acts, they stopped laboring in the community of distributing food and all those things. And they put others in charge of that so that they could give their time to the scriptures and to preaching. So I think uh, what Paul is saying here, because he was out among people who had no faith, and uh, he was showing that by doing the labor that he did, providing for himself, there were people that were not willing to listen because they thought it was about money. And this way he took that excuse away from them. And so the weak that he's talking about here is the spiritually weak, not the, uh, not the you know, infirm in body. So if you are uh, preaching in a community that has a mixture, people who are carnal and people who are spiritual, like we have in, in Corinth, then uh, you're going to have people who are going to come up with every excuse under the sun to come against the preacher. And so he was removing that as a stumbling block. He didn't want anything to stand in the way of the gospel. And so for him, this was a sacrifice unto the Lord. He gave himself to the Lord, providing for his own needs for the sake of the weak, that they might have what they needed 
spiritually. And so he says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. But he gave of himself so that they would hear the gospel without any kind of block. So it's greater, it's a greater blessing to see the spiritual needs of the weak, that they might not stumble and come to the truth, than to assert your right to provision. Uh, chapter 9. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. So apparently, the year earlier, they had all agreed that they were going to come up with this great offering. And Achaia, or the believing communities in that region, had also come into agreement, but they went ahead and pulled together immediately their offering and laid it aside to be distributed. Corinth had been very zealous, and Paul, counting the gift as already done, boasted about them, about their willingness and their generous spirit. But it would seem that they had, that zeal had waned in the following months. So Paul had sent some men ahead to stir them up and let the people know that he had been boasting about how gracious and, and generous they were. Because if he came with the people to whom he had boasted, then they would be scrambling to, together to put something together. And it would be meager. And they would be uh, giving out of shame or compulsion and not the offering that was willing and done in love. So this would be like a community who might sponsor a missionary. And the missionary is coming home for his annual visit and to give a report to the church that has sponsored them. And they know he's coming, but they fail to provide for him. They fail to provide uh, the, the offering he needs, that annual offering to sustain him. Now, if they just take up an offering that Sunday, then what's he going to get? A couple hundred dollars? Yeah. But if they know six months in advance, then they can have special offerings taken monthly or weekly, and that money is slowly built up and laid aside. So when he comes, it will be sufficient for what his needs are. So he's saying that if you've made this promise, you know, just like a person who promises to maintain a, a missionary, a church that would maintain the missionary, if you've made that promise, then follow through with it. Don't make the promise and then not come through when they need you. Verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Proverbs 11.24 says, There is one who scatters and increases yet more. There is one who withholds more than is appropriate, but gains poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat. He who waters will be watered also himself. Proverbs 19, 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to Yahweh. He will reward him. Proverbs 22, 9. He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. So there is, uh, therefore, a giving that is right in the heart of God, and the word gives us perspective. It's not about the amount that we give. It's what uh, 
uh, is in our heart that determines how liberal we are in our giving. Remember the widow who gave in, in the temple when Jesus was watching. She just gave two pennies and it was all that she had, but Yeshua respected that offering and said that she had given more than all. So our giving has to be done prayerfully and uh, in the counsel of the Holy Spirit. We should never be shamed into giving. This is one reason why Messianic communities use a sedaka box, which is set somewhere in the back. This is, you know, not a pass the plate kind of community. So that giving is done between you and the father. So when you pass the plate, the person on your right or the person on your left might be tempted to scrutinize your gift. Or if you don't have a gift, they might look at you funny and then you'll be embarrassed because you may not have anything at all, or you may have sent it in already, or you just may choose not to give that day. <coughs> Your giving is no one's business but God's. We don't give for show. We don't give because everyone expects us to give. God loves a cheerful giver. The one who loves God, loves his brothers and sisters. Uh, this is the one that God is looking for. This is like the widow that Jesus respected because what has been given has come from the heart. You might not have much. You might wish that you could give more. But God is able to take your little and do much. So remember Yeshua and the little boy's lunch. He had just a little and, and the Lord fed the many. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, verse 8, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work as it is written. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. So if we learn to flow in the economy of God, he will make sure that everyone always has enough and that we will be free to be liberal in our giving and sharing of, uh, in love of what God has really provided for us. I know this works because I've experienced it consistently. Whenever I stepped out in faith to give where the Holy Spirit led me, I always had my own needs met. My giving never left me short to care for my own expenses. Uh, verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. So it is God himself who provides us money or food or clothing and it is so that we might share with those who are in need it's the same thing i'm trying to remember the verse now this is just coming to my remembrance but it's abraham how god had blessed him to be a blessing that's what it is so he blesses us to be a blessing and uh, it is god himself that gives us the power to get wealth now that doesn't mean it gives you the power to be rich he gives you the power to have the finances that you need, the monies that you need to buy your food, to pay your bills. Paul prays that this blessing, uh, that Yahweh will supply our resources and even multiply them or increase them so we are able to give all the more. For this kind of joyful giving brings glory to God, brings good to all people and causes both the giver and the receiver to break out with thanksgiving to our God who is faithful to care for our every need. Verse 12, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal sharing with them and all men, and by their prayer for you, 
who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. So when we live in community like this, and we don't abuse the offering, and we uh, or leave one of our own to fend for themselves, you know, like it says, you know, what kind of, I think it's in James, he says, you know, what good is it to say, you know, be well, you know, and, and prosper, be, you know, in peace and, and good health, and then do nothing to help that person. Oh, you're homeless. Oh, that's too bad. Well, I hope it gets better. You know, that's not gonna, that's not gonna help. They need help. There's somebody else that we were just talking about, people who are in need. And sometimes, you know, it's not for you to open your home, you know, uh, unless there's an emergency kind of thing, because, you know, God has to give us wisdom. I've, I've done that probably too many times, you know, opened up my home to someone instead of trying to help them in a different way, because it doesn't always go so well, okay? But there may be times when they just need a place you know, to stay until they can get uh, on their feet or until they can, you know, get to the place that they need to go. But more often than not, people need your support in other ways. It could be financial. It could be helping to make phone calls. It can be helping to just do paperwork or something else that they, they have need of. You know, sometimes people are just not uh, really together enough to do the things they need to care for themselves. All these things, you know, are part of the community. And, uh, you know, I, I look around our group and I see people that step out and help people at every turn. I, helping your neighbor, you know, somebody who is just, you know, kind of lacking and uh, not just lacking financially, but in ability or transportation or some other thing. You know, all those things are the hands of Jesus helping other people out of love because you get nothing out of it. There's no financial compensation for it. And so when you reach out and you help people that way, that is, that is God being manifested in your life. You know, a lot of people think just because they don't have some spooky spiritual experience that God isn't with them. But there are times where you're gonna say just the right thing or you're gonna turn around and, and suddenly you are present in a moment where somebody needs help and you have the ability to help them, that's God living in you and working through you. So don't think that that's just for preachers on TV. My guess is you have a moral, a, a more of a Christian life than they do because yours is real. Yours isn't for show. So this is the evidence that we are the children of God. And it supports our testimony in faith in Messiah, that the gospel is true, that we're not just mere men, but the, the grace of God has become uh, real in us and made us true spiritual sons and daughters of our God and our Father in heaven. And so this is, uh, this is our testimony by living out a generous life so let's be a people that are generous, not only with material wealth, but generous with our time and our energy, being willing to give of ourselves, even when it's not convenient. That's sacrificial giving. Sometimes a person may need to just vent or to cry or, or need somebody just to listen, but mostly um, let's be let's generous with the one who has not withheld any good thing from us. Let us make ourselves available to the Lord, our Lord Yeshua, and be willing to be his hands and his feet, to care for the needs of his people. Whether you know it's right here in our community or uh, a food drive or Israel, whatever he calls us to do, I pray that we would joyfully and cheerfully say, Hineni, here I am, Lord. Verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The gift of his son, the gift of grace, the Holy Spirit living in us, the gift of God. Indescribable, unspeakable. No words can describe the greatness of what God has done to save us and make us a holy people 
with a new heart toward righteousness, a heart of flesh that loves the brethren. How good and gracious is our King. Amen.